The committee will come to order without objection. The chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. This hearing is entitled, Growing Our Economy by Investing in Families, How Supporting Family Caregiving Expands Economic Opportunity and Benefits All Americans. Can I just ask somebody on staff to please close the door so we eliminate the noise from the hallway? Um, before we proceed to opening statements, I ask for unanimous consent that members who are not on the committee be authorized to provide brief remarks when recognized by the chair. My understanding is that that will be Ms. DeLauro and Ms. Mace. Hearing none, so ordered. I welcome our witnesses, and uh, before recognizing the ranking member, recognize myself for five minutes to give an opening statement. Uh, I'm actually thrilled uh, at, this, um, at this hearing because today we take up not just the causes of economic disparity, something that is so evident uh, in all of our states and districts, but a potential solution, and a solution that I think actually uh, has a great deal of support uh, uh, in both analysis and emotion uh, and across the aisle uh, in ways that, uh, that we can do something that we as parents care deeply about, which is supporting our children and supporting the children of America. So today we'll be talking not just about one of the causes of disparity, as we have been doing on this committee for some period of time, but potentially one of the solutions. Uh, and as I said before, this is a solution that anybody who is a parent can understand because for every parent, taking care of our kids is our number one priority. And I think that we also understand that that extends to taking care of other people's kids because we do at the end of the day live in a community. Uh, this does go to our heart, but the fact that we as a nation uh, are almost dead last in investing in our youngest children amongst uh, industrialized countries should sound alarms uh, in as much as that is a threat to our global competitiveness. My friend Mr. Kilmer gave me a sign some time ago that I have in my office, and that sign reads, we are competing with everyone, everywhere, all the time. And nobody should be comfortable with the notion that we are almost dead last around industrialized countries in terms of giving our youngest citizens the step up they need to compete in that global economy. I'm also excited because, as I said before, I think there is the opportunity here uh, for this committee to do what, as chairman, I'm committed to seeing us do, which is to find those areas, small though they may be, where we can, where we can get bipartisan agreement in this polarized environment, obviously, for something to become law. It must, at the end of the day, have uh, broad agreement uh, across both parties. And we have seen in the Congress bipartisan activity, including the Creating Early Childhood uh, Leaders Act, uh, written by Mitt Romney and Bob Casey. Uh, I would note that some red states like Alabama and Florida have dramatically increased their preschool funding in the last year to the tune of six and $10 million respectively. Um, and again, this is something that uh, uh, I hope we agree is a challenge for all of us. I hope we agree that the solution probably looks like something that is satisfying to everybody, because if you talk to parents, I being one of them, um, there's a remarkable array of early childhood uh, opportunities out there. There is Head Start, there are faith-based uh, daycares, there are parents who make the decision, a more traditional decision, to stay home to take care of their children. All of those options, I think, are worthy of support, and what we really need to think about and talk about is how do we make sure that there are more options available to more people so that no child, uh, if I may make a little bit of a reference to legislation of some time ago, so that no child uh, is left behind. Um, with that, I deliberately uh, kept my remarks short because uh, my neighbor, um, chairwoman of the Appropriations Committee, uh, Rosa DeLauro is here, uh, and Rosa has no intention of retiring anytime soon, but when she does retire, uh, probably number one uh, on the list of her accomplishments will be her lifelong devotion to making sure that all children have um, the foundation uh, that they need to succeed. So with that, I will uh, yield two minutes to my friend and neighbor, uh, the chairwoman of the Appropriations Committee, Ms. DeLauro. Many thanks, Mr. Chairman, and to you and to Ranking Member Steele and all of the members of the committee and this uh, wonderful panel this morning. Thank you for inviting me to speak about how we are going to help working families and children. Mr. Chairman, you all always hear Connecticut is the richest state, but you know families struggle with the highest cost of living. People are struggling with their bills and taxes, and they need a government that looks out for the middle class, for working families, for small businesses, and the vulnerable who work hard. In the past, they had a government that jumped for the 1% and the biggest corporations. Now the focus must shift. Those corporations must pay their fair share so that we can make the critical investments in education, job-creating infrastructure, childcare, reduce drug and healthcare costs, and lower taxes for working families. 
We know that that can happen. With the gap growing between the rich and poor, government should bend over backwards for those who work so hard uh, so that we can grow the middle class again in this country. People who uh, live paycheck to paycheck. We are finally moving in that direction and making a shift, which is why I am proud that last month the House delivered for the American people by passing the Build Back Better Act, a once in a generation investment in children, families, caregivers. That included a first time investment in child care that guarantees that its cost will not exceed 7% of their income and paid family and medical leave. Build Back Better also expands and improves the child tax credit, the biggest cut in taxes for working families with children, the most groundbreaking and transformative policy, one that I have been fighting for for nearly 20 years. It lifts over 50% of our children out of poverty. It is a lifeline to the middle class. I am pleased that families with children under six receive $300 a month. Children 6 through 17 receive $250 a month. It is social security for children. We must get this done. We must sign it into law as soon as possible to ensure that families can continue to receive their monthly child tax credit payments next year. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the ranking member as well, because together we have an opportunity. We have the opportunity to build the architecture for the future of working families and for children and build a better and a stronger America, change the focus we've seen over these last decades, move it in the direction away from the wealthiest people in this nation and the wealthiest corporations to families. Make that investment in families. That is what is being done. And with that, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. DeLauro. We're honored by your presence. With that, I recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman Himes. I agree with you on the importance of early childhood education. Many families face huge challenges in affording childcare. My priority is to support families with quality, affordable, and accessible childcare. Build Back Better, though, is a toddler tax. The toddler tax would jeopardize the quality of childcare and make it less affordable and less accessible. Let's explain why. The toddler tax further emboldens the heavy hand of Washington, D.C. The toddler tax shifts the expectation of child care away from parents and extended families and towards big government. The government should not be a co-parent. Let's discuss how the toddler tax functions as a co-parent. If the toddler tax becomes law, in order to provide child care to a two-year-old, child care workers will need to have a bachelor's degree in early childhood education. This alone will remove 120,000 caretakers and put them out of a job. That is absurd. Today, child care costs the average American family $16,000 a year. If the, if the toddler tax becomes law, the government will mandate worker pay, dramatically increasing the cost of child care. The average working family will be on the hook for an additional $13,000 a year, $29,000 for child care talk, $29,000 a year for child care costs. Talk about inflation. But wait, you might have thought that everyone was going to get child care for free with a toddler tax, until you read the fine print. Nope, only free for some families. We have a worker shortage, and some may ask, will the toddler tax help parents get back to work? No, because the toddler tax doesn't have a work requirement. Currently, many moms and dads rely on faith-based providers to care for their children. So how does the toddler tax impact faith-based providers? It punches them in the face. Let me give you an example. Take a Lutheran church in Racine or McGuanago or Franklin, Wisconsin, that serves in particular Latino families. Under Build Back Better, it will be incredibly difficult for these faith-based providers to house a child care program. Child care centers and parishes, churches, synagogues, Muslim centers are under attack by BBB. With the focus on government control, you might think that the data shows government institutions provide better outcomes for children than faith-based or in-home providers. But that is not true either. The data says children are better served by faith-based providers or in-home providers. Instead, we should be focused on reducing the cost of childcare and making it affordable. Here's how. By reducing the regulatory burden for non-health and safety requirements. Two, by addressing municipal zoning for in-home providers. And three, 
providing timely payments to providers. Now let's shift gears. Let's talk about school-age children. We have a significant education gap between demographic groups in our countries, particularly among black and white children. State assessments are rolling in, and this gap has gotten a lot worse over the last two years. It is most severe for minority populations in low-income households where schools were closed the longest. So you would think that we would be doing everything we can to keep schools from closing. Unfortunately, in our largest districts, the school closures are not over. This is not good for kids and creates uncertainty for parents. Rightfully so, parents are not happy and are getting involved. We need Rep. Julia Letlow's Parents' Bill of Rights. Parents should have a right to know when, where, and what their children are learning. Parents should not be persecuted or prosecuted for getting involved. Parents should know how the funds, including the billions in COVID dollars, are being used. And no child, no child should be trapped in an underperforming school without options to go elsewhere. Parents should be able to do what is best for their children. The government is not a co-parent. We need to empower families. Mr. Chairman, today's conversation should be robust, and I look forward to the discussion. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, before we turn to our witnesses, I ask for unanimous consent to play a video from a group of Americans that share their experiences as part of the committee's mission to show America for two itself. It's become the tradition of this committee to just do three or four minutes of video where we hear from people who are out there actually doing the work and uh, living under the circumstances that the committee is uh, examining. So uh, the, the video participants are Mark Jaffe of Stanford, Connecticut, who is the CEO of uh, Children's Learning Center of Fairfield County uh, in my own district. Leslie Stroot, a high school teacher of 21 years from Olney, Maryland. Brittany Williams from Burien, Washington, who is an in-home elder and disability care provider through SEIU. And lastly, Claudia Morell, who is a family and community caregiver and CEO of the STEM Equity Initiative in Baltimore County, Maryland. Uh, hearing no objection, so ordered. program, the largest. COVID has had a dramatic impact on our program. The largest employer of our parents is the hospital. Three nurses in the doctor's offices have all told me they wouldn't be able to work otherwise. The cost for us for a pre-K child uh, is approximately $16,500. On average, in the state of Connecticut, a, a preschool teacher is paid $26,000 a year. That is shameful. Our teachers are effectively the working poor. One of the young people that we talk about, uh, he came to CLC nonverbal. And by the time he left us two years later, um, he was speaking English. Uh, and he is now a manager at Google. I spent a career in the private sector. And what I found when I came here was there was virtually nothing I could do that could have a greater impact. Parents are the primary educator, period. And parents should have a choice in how and where their child learns. Now, you leave it up to the experts, the teachers, on how they're going to implement that educational plan, but the parent as the primary educator should have a choice in what that educational plan is going to be for their child, what that educational um, environment looks like. And when parents were given the choice of you can either be virtual or nothing, you know, that was it. And they saw virtual in, in the spring of 2020 and they said, this is not going to work. And it was really fascinating to see parents come, or come together and say, hey, what can we do? How can we make this work? Who do you know? It's, it's very hard. I don't get that privilege of, oh, I can work every day, especially when you're a single parent like myself. You're only allotted those hours to work that your children are at school because of the cost of childcare and everything. Being an in-home caregiver means to me, not just a job, 
a career. You're giving them back their sense of independency. You're telling them that they matter. Sometimes you become their family. Even, even today, when I still sit and think about clients that I had before COVID and had to let go, it's heartbreaking. When I think about what the Build Back Better plan would mean, if we do not make sure that we have the proper foundation set up to support this, this baby boom, it is going to crash. We are the infrastructure of this nation, not buildings or roads. My children are uh, all essential. They all had to go to work. At the time I had three grandchildren, I now have four. Um, I can completely converted my basement to turn it into a school to homeschool them. I am the sole care provider for my mother who has dementia. It seems like the care for seniors today is only available to those who have the highest level of income. Her cost per month is about $9,000 a month. We are also trying to still work because we can't give up working. I'm not 65 yet. I'm not even then, you know, Social Security wouldn't cover it. That's middle America, middle class America. I think we're invisible and we're getting crushed. We need some help. I'm not a parent, I'm a grandparent. I still need help. Because if you take me out of this equation, the whole house collapses. Uh, thank you. Now we welcome the testimony of our distinguished witnesses. Uh, first, coming to us remotely, we have Dr. Michelle Holder, President and CEO at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. Next, we'll have Ms. I Jen Pu, Executive Director at the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Following, we will have Melissa Boteik, uh, Vice President of Income Security and Child Care at the National Women's Law Center. And finally, uh, after that, we will have Mr. Elliot Haspel, Program Officer of Education Policy and Research at the Robbins Foundation. And last but not least, we have Mrs. Denise Johnson, Founder and Executive Director of the Opportunity Calls Everyone Family Development Center from South Carolina. Ms. Johnson is a constituent of Representative Mace of South Carolina, so pursuant to our unanimous consent, uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. Mace for the purpose of a one-minute one minute introduction of, uh, of Ms. Johnson. And, and thank you, uh, Chairman Hyams and Ranking Member Style. Uh, I'm proud to join this committee this morning uh, to join the House Select Committee on Economic Disparity and Fairness and Growth to introduce my fellow South Carolinian and uh, one of my constituents here today, um, Mrs. Denise Ladson Johnson. She was born in Charleston, South Carolina and grew up in James Island where her mother was a driving force in keeping her on a path to college. She went on to obtain her Bachelor's of Social Work from Benedict College and later earned a Master's of Arts in Biblical Counseling from Luther Rice University and Seminary. Inspired by her mother, Mrs. Ladson Johnson is now back serving James Island, and we thank you for that, so others can have the same opportunities that she had. She is the wife of a supportive and loving husband, Moses, who's here with us today, and the mother of one surviving daughter, Mag Honey, 2018, and three loving children who you will hear more about today in her testimony. We look forward to hearing from the witnesses today about the scope of these issues and problems that we're facing and what we could all be doing better as legislators together to solve it. Thank you for your time and effort to be here today, both of you. And I yield back. I thank Ms. Mace. Um, our witnesses are reminded that their oral testimony will be limited to five minutes. Uh, you should be able to see a timer directly in front of you that will indicate how much time you have left. For those joining remotely, the timer will appear as a participant on your screen. When you have one minute remaining, a yellow light will appear. I would ask that you be mindful of the timer and when the red light appears, to quickly wrap up your testimony so we can be respectful of both the other witnesses and the committee members' time. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. Uh, Dr. Holder, who is coming uh, to us remotely, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Well, thank you, Chair Himes and Ranking Member Style for inviting me to speak. It's an honor to be here, albeit virtually. Uh, my name is Michelle Holder. I am President and CEO of the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, and I'm also a Professor of Economics at John Jay College, which is part of the City University of New York. I'm also a working parent of two children and a caregiver to my mother, Daphne, who suffered, who recently suffered a serious injury, which is why I can't be in Washington with you right now. 
Because I have a position that provides me with paid family leave, I'm able to take necessary time off to coordinate my mother's in-hospital care. As opposed to taking unpaid leave or being told if I take the time off, I may not have a position when I return. And because I can afford childcare for my 10 month old, as the president of a national economic think tank, my salary can accommodate that cost. I'm able to testify at this hearing right now. But many individuals and families in our country don't have these benefits from their employers or can't afford these costs. My dual roles, economist and caregiver, equip me well to explain how investment in the care economy affects our nation's macroeconomic outlook. The care economy is the system in which workers and families provide services vital to caring for the US population. From medical care to laundry, care is expensive. So many families forego support they need. As a result, the economy suffers. Economists call this a market failure. Today, I will discuss how this market failure constricts growth using two case studies, paid leave and childcare. I will then solve a puzzle. Given the common sense justification for investments in care, why do we underinvest? Biases toward economic inputs that are easily quantifiable and against women of color lead us to undervalue care, underinvest in this economic bedrock, and constrict growth. Let's start with paid leave. In six states, public programs provide time off with pay when a worker or family member experiences a serious medical issue, like cancer, or when a child joins the family. Research on these programs show that they fuel the engines of economic growth. For example, paid leave increases women's labor force participation after childbirth. Early research suggests that paid medical and caregiving leave have similar effects on work and productivity. Large workforces and increased productivity are good for business, especially small businesses trying to compete with bigger firms to attract talent. So it's not surprising that a recent study of two states with public paid leave programs finds that 70% of small employers support public paid leave. Paid leave also improves child well-being, lowering ob obesity rates and increasing reading time. That means increased human capital and productivity for tomorrow's workforce. Yet 44 states have no paid leave program. This depresses labor force participation, decreases productivity, and dampens human capital development, ultimately constricting growth. Let's turn to our next case study, child care. Similar to paid leave, affordable child care increases the likelihood that parents will work. And the positive effects of high quality preschool and human capital persist into adulthood. Additionally, more investment in childcare would improve macroeconomic stability. Currently, insufficient public investment leaves childcare centers vulnerable to economic downturns when an unemployed parents remove children from care and centers must reduce capacity. When the economy rebounds and is hungry for labor, parents can't find care, preventing their return to work and slowing economic recovery. It's clear, underinvesting in care prevents our economy from reaching its potential. So why do decision makers allow these market failures to occur? The answer, the answer is simple. They are blinded by bias. First, they are biased toward economic inputs that are easily quantifiable. Unpaid care work, which lacks a clear price tag, is excluded from official national income and product accounts. This makes it difficult to see care's costs and benefits accurately. Then biases against women of color lead decision makers to undervalue care work which women of color perform disproportionately. To be blunt, when decision makers see women of color working, they decide that that labor itself must not be valuable. Indeed, regardless of race, gender, or educational level, all care workers receive wages that are about 5% lower than wages paid for similar work that does not involve care. We also see evidence of these biases in depressed care investment overall. In conclusion, the United States ranks 37 among 38 OECD nations when it comes to expenditures on young children and their families. But we are on the cusp, cusp of change. The House passed Build Back Better Act, creates a national paid leave program, infuses resources into, into our childcare and pre-K systems, more accurately valuing care by requiring pay parity between childcare workers and school teachers, makes unprecedented investments in home and community-based services and supports for older adults and people with disabilities and recognizes that caring for children is work by extending the monthly fully refundable child tax credit without a requirement that parents work for pay. We can start here, remove the blinders of our biases, accurately revalue care work, correct market failures and allow the economy to grow unfettered.
Thank you, and I look forward to your question. Thank you, Dr. Holder. Ms. Pu, you are now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Hines, Ranking Member Style, and distinguished members of the Select Committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the importance of growing our economy by investing in care infrastructure. At the National Domestic Workers Alliance, we represent the 2.2 million nannies, home care workers, and house cleaners who do the essential work of caregiving in our homes. At Caring Across Generations, we have spent the last decade bringing families and workers together across age and ability to elevate the urgent need to invest in caregiving, including Medicaid home and community-based services for older adults and people with disabilities. I believe we have a once in a generation opportunity to transform care in America, and we can't afford not to. Every day, 10,000 people turn 65 in America, and thanks to advances in healthcare and technology, people are living longer than ever. But this is, so this is a blessing. But we have a major challenge ahead of us because we have yet to adapt any of our policies or programs to support quality of life and access to care for an extended lifespan. By 2050, 27 million people will need long-term care in America. The vast majority of those people will want to age at home, and, have, and we have neither the infrastructure nor the workforce to support it. Already, over 800,000 people with disabilities and older people are on waiting lists for services in the home and community. What we have is an over-reliance on overstretched family caregivers, who are mostly women, who are having to make impossible choices between their livelihoods or their loved ones at tremendous financial and emotional cost. And we have a reliance upon underpaid, unprotected care workers, the majority of whom are women of color, one third of whom are immigrants, and can't sustain in these jobs on the poverty wages they earn. One of our members from Georgia, Nafisa, struggled to make ends meet on her $8 per hour job as a home care worker, having to choose between putting gas in the car to get to work or buying food for her family for the week. Despite seeing her job as a calling, she had to take a job in manufacturing so that she could earn $15 per hour. According to a recent study by PHI, the average annual income of a home care worker is $18,200 per year. Low wages are compounded by lack of access to benefits. Only one in five domestic workers has access to health insurance coverage. Less than one in 10 domestic workers are covered by employer-provided retirement. There is no paid family and medical leave and 82% of domestic workers don't have a single paid sick day. These conditions lead to high turnover rates and chronic worker shortages, especially in rural communities, ultimately hurting the accessibility and quality of care for the people who need it. It's also costly to agencies that constantly need to hire and train new workers. According to one estimate, the $150 billion investment in home and community-based services in the Build Back Better Act passed by the House of Representatives will create and support 390,000 new jobs each year over 10 years, nearly 300,000 of which are living wage care jobs. It will also add an estimated $4 billion in additional income for current workers and their families each year. This is not only transformational, it is essential. As the demand for this work skyrockets, these jobs are jobs that can't be outsourced or automated. These are the jobs of the future, and we must make them good jobs. Congress should also enact the National Domestic Workers Bill of Rights legislation led by Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal and Senator Kirsten Gillibrand to ensure baseline protections such as earned sick days and safety and health protections. By investing in the domestic workforce, including raising wages and improving the quality of care jobs, we can secure working families and individuals who rely on care. We can enable working family caregivers to work with peace of mind. We can make these poverty wage jobs 
good jobs, jobs that are predominantly held by women of color, turn them into pathways to economic mobility. In short, we can promote economic growth and equity from the bottom up, from inside our homes, throughout our entire economy. I'm honored to testify before this committee today and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pooh. Ms. Boteik, you're now recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chair Himes, Ranking Member Style, and other distinguished members of the House Select Committee on Economic Disparity and Fairness and Growth. My name is Melissa Boteik, and I'm the Vice President of Income Security and Child Care at the National Women's Law Center. I'm grateful for the opportunity to testify today on the state of women's labor force participation, factors contributing to its historic low, and why building a more equitable care infrastructure as part of Build Back Better is a critical part of the solution. It is December 2021, and women have the same labor force participation rate as our mothers did in 1989. Since February of 2020, over 1.4 million have left the workforce completely, while others have cut back on their hours to manage caregiving. Studies of parents with young children during the pandemic affirm that mothers were four to five times more likely to have reduced their work hours or adjusted their schedules because of caregiving than fathers were. The crisis is not hitting all women equally. Latinas and black women have been pushed out of the labor force at twice the rate of white women. Our nation's lack of care infrastructure is an important factor in explaining these alarming trends. Even before the pandemic, families struggled to find and afford care options for children, seniors, and people with disabilities. The paid care workforce, largely black, brown, and immigrant women are paid poverty wages for doing this essential work. And the United States remains the only nation among our peers without paid leave. When COVID-19 hit, this fragile house of cards came tumbling down. Child care programs shuttered and schools closed. COVID-19 ra ravaged congregate care settings and many workers, care workers either risked health and life to work or were laid off as the economy shut down. But while a pandemic raged outside, children still needed care and education and our parents and relatives with disabilities still needed services and support. That work fell disproportionately to women. And these tremendous pressures, combined with massive job losses in women-dominated industries, pushed many mothers and caregivers out of the labor force entirely. Caregiving is the work that makes all other work possible. But as the economy reopened, the care workforce remains a fraction of its pre-pandemic size. Compared to February 2020, there are one in 10 fewer child care workers and one in eight fewer nursing and residential care facilities workers. It's not rocket science as to why. Caregiving professionals are paid wages 20% lower than professionals with comparable skills. Without public investment, many care providers do not have the resources to attract or retain new employees with higher wages. None of this is coincidental. Rather, it is rooted in a racist and sexist history of undervaluing care work precisely because of who does it, women and disproportionately women of color and immigrant women. We have privatized what should be a public good and offloaded the cost to families and care workers. Let me repeat, caregiving is a public good because our economy cannot function without it. And as the pandemic held up a mirror on our decades of disinvestment, many women looked around and said, Maybe it's not just me, and maybe it doesn't have to be this way. They're absolutely right. The experiences of our peer countries and the OECD emphasize how investing in care infrastructure is a key factor in bolstering women's labor force participation. While models differ across countries, the common denominator is investment. We spend in the United States an average of $500 per child on early childhood compared to the OECD average of $14,406. The Build Back Better Act would be transformative on this front. The investments in childcare and pre-K would offer a guarantee of childcare assistance to 93% of working family, and the typical family in 32 states would save more than $5,000 a year on childcare. Mothers with young children would see a combined increase of $24 billion in earnings. The four weeks of paid leave would add at least 3.7 million more caregivers to the workforce by 2030. 
That would include 850,000 black caregivers and 1 million Latinx caregivers. The investments in home care would support employment for family caregivers and create millions of new care jobs and improve job quality. We've been at similar inflection points in our nation's history and failed to act. 50 years ago this week, President Nixon vetoed a bipartisan universal child care bill with reverberations that run through the lives of generations of women. Since then, we fought for gains in the workforce, but the pandemic mercilessly revealed these gains were built on a foundation of sand. With Build Back Better, you have an opportunity to build a more stable and equitable foundation for our entire economy, and I join millions of your constituents nationwide in urging you to seize it. Thank you, Ms. Botek. Mr. Haspel, you're now recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Himes, Ranking Member Style, and other distinguished members. My name is Elliot Haspel. I'm the author of the book, Crawling Behind, America's Child Care Crisis and How to Fix It, as well as the Program Officer for Education Policy and Research at the Robbins Foundation in Richmond, Virginia. I'm also the proud father of two young daughters. It's not, not hyperbolic to say the American child care system is on the verge of collapse. Today, I'd like to talk to you briefly about the consequences of allowing that collapse to occur and the ways in which the Build Back Better Act would put us on a different path. Childcare today is inaccessible and unaffordable for many, if not most, working parents. It was an already scarce resource prior to the pandemic due to what the US Treasury Department calls a quote unquote unworkable business model, but COVID has irrevocably broken the fragile equilibrium. The sector's employment remains 10% below its ugly pre-pandemic levels, and thousands of programs have closed or reduced their capacity. An October poll found that one in three working parent, uh, families with young children are, quote, facing serious problems finding childcare when adult needs, adults need to work. The collapse is not bounded by geography or ideology or program type. It affects centers, faith-based care, in-home care. In a just-released study of programs across Louisiana this summer, one of the most robust data sets we have to date, nearly half, quote, indicated that they serve fewer children or turned away families due to staffing challenges, and nearly two-thirds indicated they currently had a wait list. There's every reason to think this is a nationwide trend. Even when a slot can be found, the cost is often a huge burden to young families. If you think back to the old compound interest games from high school math class, imagine how much future financial security is being sacrificed by shelling out $10,000 or more each month for childcare. Savings, retirement, the fund to buy a house or start a business. Hardworking families struggle because we treat childcare as a purely private responsibility instead of an educational and workforce support that empowers the American dream. The cause of the collapse is simple. There's not enough money in the system. In the Louisiana study, program leaders reported an inability to offer competitive wages as the key driver of their staffing challenges. So this is not a pandemic artifact. This is the new normal. Parents cannot be asked to pay more. Programs have nowhere else to turn. Public funding like that in the Build Back Better Act is the only path forward. It should be noted this is not a controversial or partisan position. In 2017, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce released a report entitled Workforce of Today, Workforce of Tomorrow, The Business Case for High Quality Child Care. Former President Trump held a White House summit on child care and paid leave in December 2019, just two years ago, where he stated, quote, in more than 60% of American homes, both parents work, yet many struggle to afford child care, which often costs more than $10,000 per year, and it's devastating to families, frankly. For the future workforce, the fact is high-quality early childhood experiences and financially stable families shape child development and show up in later life outcomes. The science is clear. Children's brain architecture develops cumulatively like building a house. The foundation for academic skills, socio-emotional skills, behavior, and health are all set in the earliest years of life. And incidentally, it's because of that last fact that paid family leave and the expanded child tax credit should be thought of as policies which also complement child care and enhance the future workforce. The benefits of a functional child care system are difficult to overstate. The benefits, which include billions of dollars annually for state economies, even extend to national security. Mike Petters, the president and CEO of Huntington Ingalls Industry, the nation's largest military shipbuild, shipbuilder, explained why in a speech I attended, stating, quote, a few years ago, I heard the then Secretary of the Navy talk about the services recruiting challenges. Look at the United States population between 18 and 25, then take away anyone without a high school diploma, anyone with physical fitness issues, anyone with a criminal record, what you're left with is about 25% of the population. Mr. Petters continued after noting the benefits of an effective early childhood program, think about how much stronger we could be if we were recruiting from a talent pool of 50 or 75 or 100 percent. Early education for all can get us there. The Build Back Better Act bill will salvage the child care sector and develop a choice-based system that works for parents and children while supercharging the American economy. It ensures that child care is affordable, the workforce is well compensated. And that improved supply pipeline matters for more than the mere existence of slots, it matters for the quality of those slots. 
Quality is the key mediator of how an early childhood experience impacts child development, and that quality is defined first and foremost by the relationship between a stable caregiver and a child in a stimulating environment. The alternative, it should be reiterated, is nothing less than the full disintegration of the U.S. child care system. The trends we are currently seeing, programmed closures, long wait lists, high turnover, women dragged out of the workforce, will only accelerate. The consequences for the American economy would be truly dire and no state would be spared. We have an opportunity to avert this fate and instead massively strengthen our nation's families and both our current and future workforce. I'd like to close by again quoting Mike Petters of Huntington Ingalls Industries. Oh, we know that the debates of the day will rage on as they always have, but one of the great strengths of America is we've always looked forward with hope and determination and imagination even while fighting the battles of today. We may feel like we're giving something to these children. The truth is they will give us infinitely more in return. Thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Haspel. Mrs. Johnson, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Ch Chairman Himes, Ranking Member Steele, and other committee members. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you all today. My name is Denise Ladson Johnson. I am the mother of three children and the founder of Opportunity Calls Everyone Development Center in James Island, South Carolina. We provide mentoring, tutoring, and summer programs for children and teens in our community so that they can embrace opportunities and reach their full potential. The children in my community are not okay. I recently asked the teenagers in my weekly mentoring program how COVID air school closure impacted them. Here's how they responded. While schools were virtual, my grades were dropping. I ended up having a 2.7 GPA. I slept more than doing anything. Before COVID closed schools, I had good behavior, good friends, and okay grades. Since COVID, I started getting into trouble a lot, making bad choices, and getting bad grades. When the pandemic started, I lost some friends and was not able to see them. The, before the pandemic, I felt really good being around my friends, but the pandemic came and I couldn't see them. I was so sad. I couldn't go to school, so I had to do it on Zoom. I didn't like it. During COVID, I drifted away from friends and basically lost all communication. Kids are our future. We have failed them by neglecting to educate them during school closures and isolating them and their friends. And now we have a whole generation that is not equipped with the education they deserve and the tools they need to thrive. What does their future look like? When the pandemic hit, my husband and I created a plan to fit each one of our children accordingly. My oldest son, AJ, was in college on an academic and football scholarship. When his school reopened in August 2020, AJ went back to school. My daughter, Monet, is in high school and tried to learn through Zoom during the school closures because my youngest son, Moses, was pre-kindergarten, which is a prime time of development. I decided to homeschool him rather than do school virtually. During the school closures, I struggle, struggled to keep my children inspired to learn and to stay motivated and learn the importance of tailoring each individual child's education to his and her learning needs. I was grateful to the woman of IWF for sharing my story on a national level as part of the pandemic learning storytelling effort earlier this year. I know I'm not alone, nor are my children or the children that come through my center. There are thousands, maybe millions of parents and children with similar stories like mine. Even though schools are open again, I am still homeschooling Moses. I remain concerned that the masking and social distancing requirements and the school's overuse of iPads would be unhealthy for his young development stage. There are too many regulations and rules for young children right now. My teenage daughter and her peers have struggled with their return to school during remote learning. My daughter's school did not provide lessons. They just gave them a bunch of assignments online. As a result, the high school kids did not learn. Unfortunately, even though schools are open now, the kids are still primarily on iPads. I understand that initially no, no one knew how to navigate this pandemic, but they've had enough time to learn how to provide consistent instruction to communicate with parents and to put initiative into schools to help equip kids with coping skills. Instead, nothing seems to be working. Teachers are burned out and aren't given their 100%. Even the school lunches are horrible and the school transportation system doesn't work. Funding a partnership with small community organizations like mine are not materializing. I'm trying to help kids and give them life skills. Kids want someone to be concerned about them and help them learn how to navigate 
even though South Carolina had a hub for after school programs and summer camps to address learning loss and providing tutoring, my organization received no response to our application. Where is the money for education going? I'm not seeing it. I feel that schools are just worried about having bodies in, their bu in the buildings for funding. They are not concerned about how the negligence is impacting our children's learning, development, and social skills. That's why my community is not prospering. The education system is not doing what they should do with the funding. The majority of, ch of students in Charleston County and across South Carolina are not meeting grade level standards in math and reading. The children in my community are smart and capable, but the adults responsible for their education are failing them. This must change. Rather than feeling trapped and failing, failing schools, parents should be empowered to choose a learning environment that works for their, ch their child and support funding students instead of large systems enabling parents to find an education option that works for their child's individual needs. I know that it is customary for members of Congress to ask Congress you know, hearing witnesses questions. I also have questions for you. Do you share my concerns that our kids are in crisis after losing over a year of learning and socialization? Are you angry that the billions in emergency federal funding are not providing the tutoring and support kids desperately need? And will you speak up for parents and students so that families have educational opportunities that meet their needs? Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Thank you very much, Mrs. Johnson. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Um, Ms. Poo, I have a question for you, and I'm going to ask the same question of Mr. Haspel. I'm uh, still chuckling a little bit at uh, my friends across the aisle uh, labeling the efforts in the Build Back Better plan a toddler tax. Um, the Build Back Better, of course, provides direct payments to families in the form of the child tax credit and tax subsidies, which would cap the out-of-pocket uh, uh, payments that families make for childcare, uh, direct payments to people as, in my estimation, understanding uh, the very opposite of a tax. But setting that aside, I do take very seriously the possibility, uh, since I am a supporter of those measures, that uh, we might inadvertently uh, create regulations and other barriers to the rollout of a universal system. Uh, the ranking member noted that it would, uh, the Build Back Better would uh, require a bachelor's degree. Um, I looked it up and that's actually limited to the lead teachers in a facility. It's also a requirement that phases in over six years and there is an exemption for childcare providers who have worked for three of the last five years in the business. It is also within a rubric that gives states the responsibility for regulating these um, these child care providers. So, Ms. Poo, my question is, um, I don't know, um, is, are the uh, limitations and the uh, mandate, uh, including this bachelor's degree requirement, are they likely to meaningfully constrict the supply of child care out there? Uh, not to my knowledge, and uh, Melissa is probably in a better position to answer this question, but my understanding is it would dramatically expand access to affordable quality child care for people who need it, including care workers like the ones that I represent. When you have a, a workforce who earns on average $18,200 a year and the average cost of child care is over $9,000 per year, we need support in order for child care to be affordable and accessible. And the programs in Build Back Better would enable that. Yeah, I, I, I think I understand the demand side. And I'll actually ask Ms. Boteic since you, since, since you indicated she has. Uh, I understand the demand side. Obviously, if we subsidize something, it's going to be easier for people to demand that good. I'm really concerned about something the ranking member raised, which is the supply side and these limited. I mean, obviously, we have a real interest in making sure that it is high quality child care, but I'd really like to get some feedback on whether Build Back Better as written with the state uh, licensing requirements is likely to reduce supply or impede the development of supply. Uh, Mrs. Boteic, and then I, I will come to you, Mr. Haspel. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, you need to turn your mic on. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, so the Build Back Better investments uh, over the first several years provide enormous, uh, enormous investments for states to be able to build up the supply of affordable and high-quality child care, both through uh, developing facilities, through investing in recruiting and training teachers, uh, all of those things. And so the phase-in is sort of intentionally designed uh, in order to help uh, address the very issues that uh, the ranking member raises. 
Uh, Mr. Hashmal. Yes, uh, so to clarify, the, the bachelor's lead teacher requirement is just for pre-K programs. So we need to distinguish. Build Back Better has two separate components to it. What they consider child care, which would be, you know, settings that are for primarily younger children and also for three and four year olds in the before and after school. And then pre-K, which is the school year, school day, what we, you know, we all sort of know DC here as universal pre-K. Um, most, uh, I think it's around half or more of state pre-K systems currently have that requirement. That includes, includes uh, Republican-led states like Kansas that they do. So this is actually not an unusual requirement. And as you note, there's a... I'm, I'm sorry, let me just clarify that. Yeah, so, so this, this... Uh, Bachelor requirement for the lead teacher already exists in many in many many states, including Republican-led states. Yes, okay. um, it does. And then uh, you know, I think to to this point of you know building out the supply um, of those teachers. Yes, by putting the, the number one constraint to supply right now is the wages. And so by putting more money into the system, we're going to be able to recruit more teachers. Right now, it's incredibly hard to staff, and this is why we have such massive staffing uh, issues right now within the childcare system. Um, the regulation that you know is traditionally not actually what basically you look at a program budget of a given child care program upwards of 70 or 80 percent of those costs are personnel uh, and so you know we need to understand that when we talk about regulation we have to keep a low child to adult ratio um, means you need a lot of people and that should be that way we want that that's what high quality comes from and so that requires having um, you know well compensated workforce which build up better does provide for so let me ask one last question. I'm not quite sure. I'll, I'll make this a jump ball because I'm not quite sure who might have the perspective. But um, we under consider uh, in this institution models of success and failure elsewhere. So my question is, um, I'm a supporter of Build Back Better, but it's possible that there are better ways to do it. Uh, there are about possible that we might learn from places like the UK, Germany, Canada, countries we think of as, as peer countries, uh, what to do and what not to do. So I wonder if I could get a witness who feels uh, 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 um, they've got the perspective to answer the question, to reflect on how do the proposals in Build Back Better compare uh, to uh, childcare in what we might consider peer countries. What can we learn from them? Are we doing better? Are we doing worse if we implement it? I, I'd love to just get that perspective in, in maybe two minutes or so. So um, one thing that's important to note is that the average uh, paid leave length in European countries is 14 months. Uh, so already um, many of the first year uh, there is a much more generous paid parental and paid family and medical leave provisions in other countries. So the United States stands alone in many ways in lacking that. Um, looking across other nations, uh, the United States is, uh, as, uh, as Ms. Holder uh, said, we are near the second to the bottom of all the OECD nations in terms of our level of investment in children um, and in early, their early care and education. So if you look at places like Denmark, France, Germany, the United Kingdom, uh, across the board, uh, those countries are all investing in some form of either free or highly subsidized childcare and early education and pre-kindergarten um, without exception. And we know that that would have an enormous impact both on children's development, um, as, as Elliot mentioned, the brain science argument, uh, but also in terms of women's labor force participation. Um, and so there's been a number of studies showing that if we were to even have similar policies in place as the United States, as the United Kingdom, Canada, Germany, countries which we frequently compare ourselves, um, that it would add over 4 million, 4.85 million more women uh, to the workforce and over $600 billion to our GDP. And that's a study from the National Partnership for Women and Families. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm out of time, so uh, I thank you for your testimony and we'll recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I think this is a pretty good, uh, robust conversation that we're having actually about BBB. Uh, I think we should really look at reducing the regulatory burden uh, in particular for non-health uh, and safety requirements. Instead, we're adding regulations. I think it's gonna dramatically increase the cost. Uh, and so what I'm hearing today is in Build Back Better, if you're low income, you get a lot of stuff for free. If you're rich, you get a salt tax cut. And if you're working and in the middle class, you get the bill. And so that's my concern, is the impact that this is going to have on working middle class people in affording child care, is child care costs are going to go up. I know some of my other colleagues are going to have questions on that. So what I want to do is shift back, if I can, and bring us back to the topic of schools and the 50 million students who are our next generation of workers. And so what's happening in schools has the potential to leave our students really unprepared for the jobs of the future. And even Democrats, like former presidential candidate, Michael Bloomberg are questioning the ability of our students to read, to write, uh, and do basic math. 
And rather than address it head on, states, including my home state of Wisconsin, uh, has lowered education standards. And even in doing that, still fewer schools are meeting those lower standards. And so in Wisconsin, we've seen lower standards. And 11th grade proficiency has dropped 21% in math and 15% in English. And so I want to ask you, uh, Ms. Johnson, if I can, and I appreciate you being here and bringing your perspective. Um, would dropping education standards for students uh, help children like yours? Yes, definitely. Um, it would, well, oh, no, on. definitely it, it, no, it won't. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> no, definitely it won't drop. Um, it won't impact. Uh, it will impact, definitely, because, for instance, my daughter, you know, I don't think that they should feel that a D is passing. Um, when I was growing up, a C was barely passing. We had to make A's and B's. So just lowering the standards for our children and, their, and, with, and lowering the standards for the children right now is not benefiting them because they're barely getting the education that they deserve and what they need now. So lowering the standards, lowering everything, that's, how is that going to impact our children? I agree with you. And we have, there's a great letter from a group of scientists warning about the erosion of American standards. And I think it's, well, it's helpful to hear what the data says. Having the perspective of you, a mother uh, who's lived this, I think is equally important. I appreciate you coming here and voicing uh, your view. I want to go back to the three questions that you offered in your opening testimony. You asked, do you share uh, the concern that our kids are in a crisis after losing a year of learning and socialization? Absolutely, I'm concerned. Uh, over the past two years, I think the needs of our children have not always come first. Uh, and now we're seeing the growing education gap as a result of that. You asked, are you angry that the billions in emergency federal funding are not providing the tutoring and support our children need? You're darn right I'm frustrated. Billions have been provided through multiple COVID relief bills for addressing learning loss during this pandemic. And since the beginning of the year, I've continued to reach out to try to get information on how this is being spent. And we still got a lot of questions as to how this money is actually going to help people. You asked, will you speak up for parents and students so that families have educational opportunities to meet their needs? And so I'm proud to co-sponsor Julia Letlow's Parents' Bill of Rights because I think it helps parents and students. And so I wanna know, and in this bill, do you agree that parents should have a right to know what their children are being taught? Absolutely. Should parents have a right to be heard? Absolutely. And should parents have the right to see school budgets and spending? Yes, absolutely. Should parents have the right to protect their children's privacy? Absolutely. Should parents have the right to keep children safe? Absolutely, yes. And to me, I think one of the most incredibly important things is that parents and children shouldn't be trapped in underperforming schools. We, we got to do is turn this around and make sure what we are doing is what's best for parents and their children. I want to talk, if I can, just a little bit more uh, about the children in your community. Um, you spoke about your youngest son, Moses. Uh, has his elementary school uh, reopened? Yes, um, briefly. When a lot of teachers were ill, they had to close down school for two weeks. Teachers or family members, and that was unexpected. We got a phone call through automatic service saying that school will not resume on Monday. Okay. And so during the period of time, originally when it was closed, how was your, your son being instructed? I believe he was five years old at the time. He was. How was he being instructed? Well, I didn't send him back to school after the closure, the first part of his school year, um, because of just the indecisiveness that they had as far as what was the regulations, what were they going to do with the kids. They were giving them half days where they were going to put, were going full, full day. So it was a A, B day. Half between 10 and 11, well, 8 o'clock until 11 o'clock. And then we would have to pick them up and then another half of children would come. So I don't understand how would that benefit and how, as far as working parents, how are we going to be able to manage that scheduling with jobs and then have to bring our kids back home because I, of them? I, I share a lot of your concerns. I appreciate you coming here and bringing your perspective. I think what we really need is a Parents' Bill of Rights. It predates the pandemic, uh, but I think it's more important now than ever uh, as we see uh, families uh, and students continue to struggle. Appreciate your testimony here today, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you.
I thank the ranking member. Um, before I recognize Ms. Moore, we're fortunate today to have good attendance, to have a big panel, and to have lots of audience members. So I'll just remind everybody in the room that House rules require the wearing of masks unless speaking, obviously drinking, that sort of thing. But I would just ask everybody in the room to please do a, a, their best to comply with that. Uh, and with that, I will recognize Ms. Moore for five minutes. Uh, Okay, uh, I, um, I will recognize Ms. Kaptur for five minutes. Sorry for the confusion. Okay, uh, Ms. Moore, do you uh, do you want to pass? Mr. I'll Chair, I, I absolutely would not. Uh, I will. I will come back to you. <laughs> All right, Ms. Moore is recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much. This has been an extraordinary panel, and the frustration with the five minutes is that you really can't ask all the questions that you wanna ask. Uh, Dr. Michelle Holder, I hope that you're still there somewhere. Uh, if not, I just really want uh, the record to be really clear that your testimony has been so fundamental. It's my biggest frustration with the whole discussion of the Build Back Better bill is that somehow it's social spending versus the 750 something billion dollars that we, that we authorized for the defense bill yesterday, uh, which is social spending too, <laughs> to, uh, to fund our, our defenses, but to demonstrate that just like any other bill, that, uh, that the Build Back Better bill really adds to our economic uh, activity. Uh, and of course, as a baby boomer, I'm one of those people uh, who's turning 65 every single day, uh, and there'll be 27, as you pointed out, Ms. Pooh, there'll be 27 million people who will want to stay home uh, versus being in a daycare center. I remember seeing you on TV, and I just got so excited uh, and <laughs> said I just got to meet, meet her. And I, I wanted to meet you because I, I have introduced a bill which uh, the Progressive Caucus and others have uh, looked at uh, called the Worker Act which would recognize unpaid caregiving um, as, uh, as big, big. It, it's, it's a, uh, a 400, about $456 billion a year of unpaid work, which all of you have pointed out, we rely on women primarily and women of color primarily uh, to undertake. And all of us are gonna need this care uh, at some point whether we're elderly and in hospice or whether we're very young children uh, in, in child care. So I really think this is an important hearing um, today. I, I guess if I were to uh, ask a question, I guess, I'm, um, I, I guess I would uh, focus on providing the future workforce uh, and the benefits. Uh, just want you to elaborate a little bit about about, you know, about kindergarten, which started at age six, uh, and what loss, learning loss, to talk about what Ms. Johnson is fo focused on, can we expect not to extend preschool uh, care? Have, have, what have we learned in those times? Whoever thinks that they're the best person to answer that question, I'd be really interested in yielding. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, so the benefits of pre-K are really well established. So when we actually had recently, I believe it was earlier this year, last year, results came out of a study from Boston. And Boston was interesting because they did a natural experiment. Basically, they extended public pre-K, they didn't have enough slots, so they did a lottery. Everyone was eligible across income spectrums. And so we ended up with some lottery winners and some lottery losers, and then they were able to track the different you know, tr uh, cohorts through high school and even into college. And what they found was that those attending public pre-K across income levels and across racial and other uh, demographic levels had significantly better outcomes. They were, uh, I think, six to eight percent more likely to graduate high school. They were less likely to have uh, an incident of juvenile uh, sort of disciplinary issues. They were more likely to uh, attend college and even more likely to graduate college. So uh, we do know, we have very robust evidence here in the U.S. that we are enhancing our future workforce. Uh, you know, you can see that even showing up in future earnings. And, and, and that line. definitely has an economic impact. Absolutely. You know, I, I was stunned by um, comments earlier about, uh, uh, about how this will have an impact on religious organizations. And I know the Lutherans do a fantastic job and Catholics in my community helping with uh, refugees and providing counseling services. I remember at one point I was having a big fight 
with my daughter when she was 16 and knew everything. Uh, and Lutheran Social Services helped us get through my not killing her. Um, and, uh, and her not killing me and us having a loving relationship now. But that being said, um, the, uh, it, there's no discrimination in the Build Back Better. The, the rules that we're asking for in terms of non-discrimination are no different than religious organizations already provide. Is that true? We have, and last Joe, uh, Rabbi Peshner testified that, that they're already providing all these social services under current anti-discrimination laws. Is, is that correct? That's absolutely Absolutely right. In fact, Build Back Better says explicitly that there's nothing that would prevent religious organizations from participating if freely chosen by the parent. Um, and there's, not, there's no new um, re requirements with regards to that. Okay, well, thank you so much, and I would yield back. Gentlewoman yields. Mr. Arrington is recognized for five Chairman, minutes. Chairman, thank you for the uh, hearing witnesses. Thank you for your time. Um, I, I think the intentions and the goodwill are uh, real across the aisle and across the spectrum here in terms of wanting to help families and children in our country. I don't have any question. But, <laughs> you know, the road to bad outcomes is paved with good intentions. And I think that the Build Back Better on whole uh, will result in a lot of bad outcomes. A lot of bad outcomes. And, and, and so let me... Let me start with um, uh, Agent Poo, Ms. Agent Poo. Um, are rising costs a real strain on working families today? Yes, they are. Um, we've seen policies led by the Democrats, and I want the context to be for all to understand that while I appreciate the chairman's comments, that generally we find consensus in order to pass legislation that is this significant and this vast and this numerous, that is not the case. So let's be clear, this is purely partisan. It's been done on both sides, I don't disagree, but this is a purely partisan bill. Not a single Republican. Out of, out of literally thousands of amendments, there wasn't a single amendment accepted. So let's just make sure that's clear. The policies of paying people to stay at home rather than to go back to work because you're paying them more to be at home than at work when we, as Republicans, offered, I think, common sense amendments that said, just don't pay people more to be on unemployment than to be back to work if we're trying to recover. And the massive trillions of dollars in spending that was supposed to be for COVID, but was really bailing out union pensions and other things that we need to deal with, no question. We're probably going to have to spend some money, no question. But we have, we have created a... A, a storm of, of, of inflation and burden, and quite frankly, it's the tax on every man, and that's only going to get worse. Even liberal tax policy experts say the taxes will translate to higher cost and lower wages. So I agree with Ms. Agent Pooh. It, this is, inflation is real. $377 on average for our families, that's a car payment, that's utilities. Folks can't even afford to fill up their car and get to work. And we're talking about expanding the entitlement without, without work. We're talking about more deficit spending. We're talking about more translation into inflation. And, and, and I'll get back to you. I promise Mr. I'll come back to you. Thank you for making it a quick answer. Uh, Ms. Botaic, are fewer jobs and lower wages better or worse for working families? I don't think that we need to put those two against each are, other. Are, are they better or worse? Are, it, it, are, are fewer jobs and lower wages better or worse for working families? The Build Back Better Act creates millions of okay. jobs and at the same time raises wages okay. for uh, care workers okay. as well as many other workers. Well, listen, here's the deal. We had millions of jobs created by our job creators when we lessened the burden and all boats rose on the tide of prosperity. Wages went up at the highest rate in recorded history. Poverty went down, poverty rate lowest in recorded history. It wasn't because of some central plan government, you know, way to help everybody. Help me less government is what I would say. It was because we unleashed uh, uh, the free markets, the economy. We, we allowed families to keep more of their paycheck. And, and by the way, 
when I hear people, and I appreciate Mr. Laura, she's a fine lady, but she talks about helping the small business. Baloney. There are surtaxes upon surtaxes that are going to create a tax system for small businesses where most of small businesses are going to pay more than 50% of their income to the government at the state and federal level. That is not going to help our working families. So that's a problem. Um, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Elliott, um, should, um, should able-bodied people who receive taxpayer assistance who need it, okay, no dispute there, should they be able, should they be required or expected or incentivized to either work or be looking for work? Yes or no? I think that's a more nuanced question. No, it's not a nuanced question. Should people who receive assistance who need it, I'm not dis dis disputing that there's, there are needs out there, but if they're able to work, should they be expected to and should we as policymakers incentivize people to work? I would say that the Build Back Better plan does help working families in particular for this It period. takes out the work requirement with a trillion dollar no, new cash. Congress Hold on a second, res Let me, respect please. Re let's re it takes away the work requirement in a refundable tax credit that's a trillion dollars. And, and in my opinion, with all due respect, it's gonna trap more people, not lift more people out of poverty. Mr. We're, Chairman, I know I've gone over my time. I've got a whole set yeah. of, of, of issues. I hope we have second and third rounds because I have, I have concerns and I know I've taken more of the time than, I, than is allotted me. So I hope we get more discussion in here uh, for this hearing. Thank you and I yield back and I thank the witnesses for their comments. Gentleman yields, Ms. Jayapal is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, really appreciate the testimony of all of our witnesses today. I'm not sure that Ms. Poo was actually making the same argument as my colleague who just spoke. I would say that rising costs in the form of housing, childcare, these are the inflationary costs that Build Back Better will actually address. And Ms. Poo, I just wanted to give you a quick opportunity before I launch into my prepared uh, set of questions. Thank you, Congresswoman. Yes, I wanted to say that the caregiving investments in the Build Back Better Act are actually about enabling work and jobs. Um, care jobs are job enabling jobs. Child care makes it possible for parents to go to work. Um, it makes it possible, home and community-based services make it possible for working family and caregivers, the 48 million of them in the United States, to go to work. So investing in the care economy is about enabling work and it's about lowering costs. Making child care affordable is about lowering one of the most important and largest fixed costs for working families. Making elder care more affordable is about lowering costs for families who have aging adults and people with disabilities in their lives, period. Thank you, Ms. Poo. Uh, I, I completely agree. The Build Back Better Act is going to lift wages for child care workers and entice more people to join this invaluable workforce while ensuring that child care is affordable. On average, Washington households, that's my state, already spend 14% of their income per child on child care, and it's higher in metro areas, which is something, by the way, that I don't think we've adequately addressed in uh, looking at a state median income, which really leaves out, for example, in my district, two teachers who earn $68,000 with very high housing costs and child care costs. They actually won't qualify as soon as I would like them to in Build Back Better. Meanwhile, child care workers make poverty wages. About half a million child care workers are domestic workers who lack basic worker protections under federal law. And my Domestic Workers Bill of Rights would rectify that oversight, extend overtime pay to them, and guarantee them essential rights on the job. Together, these bills would address long-held disparities for all, especially the women in communities of color that are overrepresented among childcare workers. I have a question for Dr. Holder, who I know is uh, virtual. Families in high cost of living areas find it difficult to build generational wealth while struggling to pay for childcare, which can cost as much as $2,400 per month per child. For families who can't afford it, women often face the choice of dropping out of the workforce and losing income to provide their own care. Dr. Holder, how would ensuring universal child care for every family impact their asset building opportunities? 
Thank you for that, that question, Ms. Jayapal. Um, it would uh, allow uh, families to uh, be able to, um, you know, uh, continue to work uh, as opposed to uh, if they have a childcare crisis and cannot afford childcare, uh, either they have to decide whether or not, you know, they have to leave a position. Um, childcare, you know, um, I think that the thing that, um, you, that came to light last year as a result of the, um, what COVID did to our economy is that we really recognize that, you know, that schools, aside from the fact that they educate our children, they are a place where, you know, we know our children will be safe, will be fed while we work. And, uh, you know, fully one third of, of women who work in this country are mothers. So, you know, the need to uh, provide affordable childcare um, is critical. Uh, we, don't, we don't need families you know, exhausting whatever savings they have to be able to afford childcare during a caregiving crisis. Um, and, and it, you know, the, this particular cost is a very real one to most families. Thank you. Ms. Poo, uh, I want to go to wages. According to the Economic Policy Institute, the median childcare worker in my home state would have to spend 53.4% of their earnings to put their own child in infant care. So at current wages for nannies and childcare workers, are these workers able to adequately provide for their own families and who do they rely on for childcare? No, this is one of the biggest tensions and I think contradictions in our society where the people that we count on to care for us and our families as a profession can't take care of themselves or their own families doing this work. So people are having to rely upon in, informal care networks, having to periodically drop out of the workforce. It's an incredibly unsustainable and insecure situation to be in, which is why the Build Back Better investments are so, so transformative. Truly transformative. I see my time has expired. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentlewoman yields. Mr. Donalds is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, look, so much to talk about, so little time. Um, let's start here. I want to go back a little bit to the actual uh, child care provisions um, with respect to uh, Build Back Better. And I, I know we're talking about an important topic, and the whole focus seems to already be Build Back Better, but it needs to be kind of covered. Um, in, you know, in the bill, the way I'm reading it, um, there was a change in policy that basically designates the funds associated with child care as federal financial assistance and also imposes federal Head Start restrictions. So according to HHS, Head Start provides about 1,500, provides funding to about 1,500 entities. Roughly only 33 or 2% have religious affiliations. There's been an article in the New York Times where um, that, that, that the plan has actually faced strong opposition from religious groups for that same reason. So if you look at the situation where roughly, let's call it half of the child care services in the United States are provided by faith-based uh, centers or institutions, I know that for a fact because two of my three children went to faith-based uh, or programs that were basically in a church. Two of my three kids went there. Um, if that's going to be the basis, you know, we're gonna, this is going to cause some problems. Let's just call it what it is. Um, secondarily, and, and you know, Mr. Johnson, I want to ask you a question because I was reading in your in your bio that um, you actually run a, a center. So I, I mean, I'll ask you directly: um, if it is harder for you to actually have childcare providers working in your facility, will that actually make it more expensive to run your facility? Will that increase costs, whether it be the federal government? or a parent trying to provide, trying to get child care for their child? Well, currently, I don't have a facility facility. Oh, my, um, my, my fault, my fault, that's my, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, But I have worked with child care licensing in the state of South Carolina as well, so I can answer the questions sure. up there. Um, definitely, I feel that the system that we have in place for the you know, for the daycare centers and, and the child care centers and so forth, um, I feel that we should definitely impact with the learning ability first. You know, see if these are standards that these teachers that are teaching and also the faith base if there are. Um, because, you know, the faith base is kind of a sticky situation because just like you say, there are churches, mm. right? 
um, for my center, and it's an upcoming um, center because I'm really housed in a ultra culture center. I'm in an art and culture center for mentoring program. But um, so I really can't really base the answer to the question mm -hmm. basically right now because I don't have a center center. That's fair. I'll open it up. Yeah. If the cost of it's essentially if you have a situation where which we currently have right now where under the child tax provisions you have workers who will potentially because child care workers i mean they got kids too that's just the reality of the situation well they will effectively be getting you know hundreds of dollars per month per child um will that actually increase the cost to per two centers of labor will it actually increase the cost for them to get people to come in and work the necessary hours if they're already getting hundreds of dollars from the federal government with respect to child tax <coughs> extensions. So I was going to address the, um, the arguments that you made about religious providers um, as someone also who put both of my children through religious preschool. But I mean, hold on, I gotta stop right. you. I got one minute and 15 yeah, seconds. No, okay. I wanted to focus on child tax. The child let's tax go there. credit? Yeah, because look, here's the reality. Child tax credit is roughly $275 or $300 per child, depending on your situation, right? If you're getting that money in your pocketbook, what is going to happen is either A, you're just gonna go back to work and work your 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours, whatever, 35 hours, or B, you're gonna choose not to work the additional hours because the federal government is providing a direct benefit with respect to child tax credit. So economically speaking, something's gonna give. You're either gonna work more hours or you're not gonna work more hours. And if you choose to work more hours, the economic argument is that my additional time, which I could not go to work because my budget is now full, you're gonna have to pay me an additional dollar or additional X amount of dollars in order for me to decide to go into the workforce. So does that provision actually not only increase the cost of childcare, but increase the cost of virtually everything in the United States when people have a now an economic decision to make of whether they're gonna go to work or not? No. Um, it does not. Ch the child wow. tax credit and child care are complementary policies. And in fact, there are reams of research showing uh, not only does it cut child poverty dramatically, uh, which as we've discussed has long-term implications for the workforce, uh, but it actually, the way that parents are spending it in many cases is it helps them go to work. I have uh, no idea where you guys did like that research. Um, and because if you talk to any business owner in our country, and I've talked to hundreds of them in my districts about this provision specifically, they're all very concerned about what it's gonna mean with respect to actually having to pay more in wages to get people to come in because now small business owners are gonna to continue to be in direct competition with the federal government when it comes to dollars going into people's pockets. We've already seen it when you have gas stations having to pay people $500 to fill out an application. We've already seen it. Uh, there have been multiple surveys nationally representative of small business owners who overwhelmingly support the child tax credit for many reasons, but one of them is that it increases demand in the economy, which then increases demand for their goods and services and is good for business. If there's more demand in the economy, yeah, the but gentleman's time has expired. Fair enough. Okay. I, see, that's what I'm saying. So much to talk about, so little time. That's why. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Craig uh, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for holding this hearing, and uh, especially thanks to our witnesses who have uh, appeared here this morning. Uh, this hearing could not have come at a better time uh, with the conversations that I'm having in my district in Minnesota, too. Two weeks ago, I met with my family uh, farmer advisory council uh, in Cannon Falls, Minnesota, and we talked about the challenges that they're facing in rural and ag communities uh, to find people to, to come to work. One of that labor shortage that we talked about, it really impacts all sectors. We discussed some of the reasons for the shortage and uh, despite what uh, my previous colleagues said, it's, it's no surprise that access to affordable childcare came up uh, time and time again as one reason why folks, uh, particularly women, are not coming back uh, into the labor market. Uh, another member of the council, my uh, farmer advisory council, discussed their experience caring for his adult son uh, who is, uh, has special needs uh, for his care. These stories made me think back to a conversation I had with another constituent not too long ago. In September, I met with uh, Carrie Ottoman, a mother and an advocate for her son, Keegan, who suffered serious injuries in a 2015 accident and needs care 24 seven. 
Carrie and I discuss the work that she does caring for Keegan at her home in Lakeville. I was struck by the extraordinary and difficult job that Carrie and her family do caring for Keegan and Carrie's mother, who also lives with them. It was clear to me that Carrie and her family deserve to know that as they get older and aren't uh, any longer able to care for Keegan, that there will be caregivers able and willing to step into their roles. That's the reason that uh, I'm a proud co-sponsor of the uh, Better Care, Better Jobs Act. And it's the reason I continue to push to make sure that funding for home uh, care workers is included and remains in the Build Back Better Act. With that context in mind, I'd like to direct my first question uh, to Ms. Poo. Um, Ms. Poo, in your testimony, you highlighted the enormous cost of undervaluing care workers to American families and the economy. Can you speak to what, if any, regional differences there are in these costs? And if not, uh, are there any factors you think we should be considering as we think about tailoring support for the care economy? Thank you so much for the question, Congresswoman. And I will um, say that it's ex precisely why we need the Better Care, Better Jobs Act and why we need Build Back Better to become law. Right now, we have home care deserts and labor shortages in, co in counties all over the country, and especially in rural parts of the country. There are huge, huge gaps in access to services for people who need them, like the constituents whose stories you just named. And it's because the wages are so low. In rural parts of the community, there are also additional costs and time related to transportation for workers to get from client to client. It's very difficult to retain and attract workers on poverty wages in that context, which is why the, um, the ability to raise wages and make these jobs good jobs is so essential. And by the way, creating access to home and community-based services for people who need this care is cost-effective. It saves taxpayer dollars. Every day that we're able to keep people out of nursing homes is a day that we save taxpayers money. Um, the average cost of keeping someone in a nursing home is three times as much as the cost of home care. So we are actually building an infrastructure and a workforce for the future that will long-term save states and every region in this country a huge amount of money. Thank you so much for helping us better understand that. Um, Mr. Haspel, I don't only have 40 seconds, but uh, a similar question about any regional differences when it comes to child care. Trends, data, anything you'd like to uh, add to that? Yes, Congresswoman. So the Bipartisan Policy Center did a study where they looked at 35 states and where they compared urban and rural demand. And what they actually found is that despite the fact that urban areas certainly have more children, the, the gap in supply to demand for child care within rural areas is actually 10% higher. I don't know the exact number, I think it's about 25% gap in the urban areas. 35% in the rural areas. They didn't have any for Minnesota specifically, but I know that was true for other Midwest states uh, like Wisconsin and Michigan. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Haspel. And with that, uh, my time has expired and I yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields. Mr. Davidson is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to our colleagues for the preparation for this hearing. And thanks for the witnesses for coming and doing the work that you're doing to you know, offer your own perspectives in terms of how our country might solve this, how our communities, we disagree on some of those solutions. Uh, but I think, you know, the great thing is the United States has a pretty big social safety net. We spend, net of uh, COVID year, we spend about a trillion dollars a year on around 90 means-tested programs. So not Social Security, not Medicare, those are products you're forced to buy. Uh, some would say uh, deficient products, uh, certainly uh, soon to be bankrupt if we don't intervene uh, and make them more actuarially sound. Uh, but if you look at the safety net proper, things that are means tested, uh, there, are, there are real problems with how that works. It's great that it's there, but let's look at how it um, impacts families. Uh, in our effort to help, there should never be a federal program that makes life harder for families. Uh, I hope we all agree on that. And I have proposed a solution to, this, uh, to the deficiencies in this. It's called the People Care Act. The People Care Act would have four Republicans and four Democrats. They would get a year and a half to work together. They couldn't cut spending, so that takes the scare tactic of one side off the 
table. They couldn't launch new stuff, which takes the scare tactic of the other. So what could they do? Well, they could do any of the things that don't do those. They could propose changes that deal with benefit cliffs, for example. They could consolidate programs that over time, for example, uh, I think we have five school nutrition programs. It started off with a school lunch program, and we found that it was so vital for our kids to be able to have nutrition uh, that we said we should do before school, after school, we should have summer programs. Uh, but you look at some, some of the challenges, the government in often cases is competing with family life. They're certainly competing with the faith community to try to reach people with the same goals. And so my question is, how can we reinforce that? The goal of that committee is to say, let, let, let eight people of goodwill who would pick their own chair, uh, chair of the committee work together to propose a solution. And at the end of that year and a half, Congress would get a yes or no vote. Does it really make it better? It's hard to think that if with a year and a half working together, eight people of goodwill could not make the system better. So, uh, Ms. Johnson, as you look at the work that you've done and highlighted, maybe could you highlight some of the challenges in the current system uh, for families? Yes. Um, currently, the challenges that families face definitely is childcare, um, working parents, having to work, stay home. Um, but also, we are challenging with our kids' mental. Our kids are burnt out as well. Our kids are not motivated. Um, they are not, um, you know, you have to keep them motivated, but then if the parents are burnt out and they're doing things as far as dealing with the pandemic, how can we expect our children to be able to navigate as well if we're parents trying to navigate? So I think basically um, right now we need to not just base on the numbers of COVID, we need a uh, virus, we need to look at the homes as far as suicidal that our teenagers are facing middle school students as well. We need to also think about um, alcohol and drug addiction and use. We need to also think about what is driving them. They're on the social media, even though they're on the iPads, but the social media that, we're, that they are looking at is pers uh, persuading them to, to think that, we, that that's how they should live their life. And they're getting depressed from it. Yeah, because they're seeing thank you for media. highlighting some of those, and I you wish know? we could, Sorry. and hopefully can somewhere else, talk, talk more in depth. And I, what you ran through were a lot of cultural challenges. And when you think about the challenge, I think a lot of times when we talk about families, we think of this kind of uniform, two parents at home family. But the census this year showed that only about a third of families is that the case. Uh, in fact, that when you look at uh, 12 to 17-year-olds, over 40% of kids have no parent. They're not living with a parent. So how do we design programs that, that address, address those challenges? And I would say that we're not gonna do it one bill at a time. Uh, we've seen how this place politicizes efforts to solve problems. Uh, and, and I just hope that my colleagues will take a sincere, earnest look at the People Care Act because it gives us a chance to break, sort of like the goal of this committee, break the normal way business is done here. One of the problems with our committees of jurisdiction is they can only deal with a little slice. I'm on financial services. We could deal with housing, but only in respect to this way. We can't look comprehensively. And that's the same problem our social workers have. When somebody comes in, they can't sit down and get to know them as a person and say, you know, I got 90 programs. Let me design something that will help you. Instead, they administer programs. I've talked to social workers all over Ohio that are frustrated by that. And I've talked to people that are trying to get help that if they just got married, they would lose the benefit for tuition for a single mom, for example. So there are a lot of things that we could do together. I hope we can do it in a nonpartisan, nonpolitical way with the People Care Act, and I yield. Uh, gentleman's time has expired. Ms. Kaptur is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank all of our witnesses today for the work you do, the vital work that you do. and. Um, uh, I don't have a chance to say very much in five minutes, uh, but my concern uh, is, uh, number one, thank you for coming because you're at the beginning of a discussion for our country about the care economy. This is going to take a while, uh, but you are all uh, leaders and pioneers in this great effort, and I thank you very much for taking time to be with us today. My concern it deals with the long-term financial viability of any 
action the federal government takes, I personally believe that the Social Security program is the most successful program that we have ever passed in the Congress that links work to benefit. And if you look at decades of investment, it's, almost, it's like an annuity, um, when people work, something is taken out of their check, but the company matches it. And one of my concerns about the care economy, which is so vital to the health and welfare of all American families, is how do we get corporate contributions into these programs? Because really, starting in about the 1980s, before the 1980s, we used to have a corporate compact. When you worked for a company, uh, you had a health benefit that was a part of that company, uh, many times negotiated in my part of the country, if you have trade unions, uh, and you had a pension benefit. But yet we saw in the state of Ohio that compact shattered when uh, the central state's uh, retirement fund uh, had to notify its workers, truck drivers, and um, uh, miners and tradespeople that they might not get the pension they'd paid into because big companies like UPS walked away, walked away, and they left this big hole in this pension fund. That was not under Social Security. That was in a different pension program. But the point was, since about the 1980s, the private sector that employs people has walked away from its social responsibilities. That used to be the social compact between work and workers. This is a big problem. And what's been happening is that health benefits have fallen on the federal government. Then when pension plans are about to expire because the private sector walked away, okay, they walked away, then come to the federal government. You know, they'll give you the money. And with the programs that deal with the caring economy, I want to set up a means, and I'm challenging all of you to think about this when you go home and talk to your compatriots across the country. We need something like the Social Security program with a fourth leg, a caring leg, that every worker contributes to and the companies do too. And we get a big enough fund in order to help people succeed, help our children, help our families, those who are caring for members of their family who are ill. We know what that's like in our family. We know how much it costs. We know when you have to work to support the family, uh, what, what that requires of a human being. Um, but I think we need a fourth leg of Social Security. We have a retirement program now in Social Security. We have a disability program. We have a uh, child survivorship program. What about expanding one of those or creating a fourth leg? I just throw that out at you because then the private sector can't get out. They're in the web of American life. And we have to get back to that. That's when we had a humane country. We have a very cutthroat country right now where very powerful institutions do not meet their social obligations. So I am concerned about, I won't go through all of this, but I will place it on the record, why after the next two years, what we are fighting for to try to help create this caring economy uh, from an appropriation standpoint, it becomes much more difficult to sustain it after 2025. We have to look to the long term. Like Mr. Davison said, he and I might not agree on all the elements. However, we both agree that work should be rewarded. We agree on that basic value. And you work. I'd like to see all these members of Congress take care of 25 kids. I mean, that is hard work. And uh, so I'm just looking at the financing element, and I wanted to uh, throw that uh, out there for consideration. And I will have some comments to place in the record, Mr. Chairman, uh, relating to the way that over a period of years, what is currently in the existing proposal, the BBB, uh, is not sustainable. Uh, we have to find a way to make it sustainable. And so view your pioneering efforts here this morning as extremely important and to help guide our country because you are giving voice to a part of America that has not been heard from. The other small point I wanted to make was we fund, as a federal government, health care centers across this country in every community, thousands of them, okay? I look at those facilities, I look at the people that work there and ask, what's the connection between the care economy and our federally supported federal health uh, care centers? There may be a nexus there in some way that we haven't 
uh, thought about enough where we are already paying for certain facilities to be out in rural communities and urban communities and maybe there's a way to provide certain services through there. Just something to think about uh, as we seek a better answer for all of our people. I thank you very, very much for being here this morning. Give you a big applause. Uh, you do the hard work of America. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady's time has expired. Mr. Gonzalez is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, thank you to the panel for being here on such an important uh, issue that's impacting America. We know um, how unpaid care responsibilities contribute to women leaving the work workforce, uh, often having severe impacts on Hispanic mothers. In, in my district, it's a reality that we see all too often in South Texas. According to the Pew Research Center, over 25% of the nation's newborns are Hispanic, so it stands to reason that without investments, the level of unpaid care responsibilities will likely rise. Uh, Ms. Boatek, the what positive impacts to mothers and caregivers of young children, not only in the workplace, uh, but in education and professional development, can we expect to see specifically realized by these investments that we're making today? Thank you for that question. Uh, in short, the, the investments that the Build Back Better Act considers are both short term and well into the future. Um, you mentioned um, Latina mothers. Uh, you know, black and Latina women have been pushed out of the workforce at twice the rate of white women. Um, and it stands to reason that these investments in care infrastructure, uh, particularly in childcare and early learning, uh, which is where, where my focus is, would have lifetime impacts. So for example, uh, the National Women's Law Center, along with the Center for the Study of Poverty at Columbia University did a study of what would be the lifetime effects of investing in childcare for all who need it. And we found a $94,000 increase in lifetime income. And similarly, about $30,000 between Social Security increased contributions and private savings from uh, women being able to re-enter the workforce. So 17% increase in women's labor force participation uh, and over 30% for women without a college degree among which women of color are overrepresented. And so we're talking about not just today with the children who are invested in, have, like with the brain development, with their education, with their ability to have higher earnings, higher um, graduation rates, all of those things that uh, my colleague, Mr. Haspel, discussed, but also their mothers and their grandmothers being more economically secure, uh, which in its own right, uh, that reduced stress, that increased income has enormous impacts on children and family well-being. Wow, quite impactful, thank you. Um, many of, of my colleagues and I have heard a lot about staffing shortages in several sectors of the economy, especially within the child care space. Uh, Mr. Haspel, within the Build Back Better Act, what specific policies, and I'm asking specific, are being put into place that will help address these staffing shortages, and how will these policies impact the staffing shortages and help keep costs down moving forward? Yeah, thank you, Congressman. So the Build Back Better Act requires every state to set a, put in page a wage scale that is the floor of a living wage. So no child care practitioner will be getting less than a living wage. And then each state will, within its own context, determine a ladder. So as people get more experience and credentials, they walk themselves up towards eventually, you know, hopefully reaching pay parity with the kindergarten teacher, essentially. Also requires the states to do what's called a cost of quality study. So it's called this you know, talk about the costs, sort of we're missing the fact that childcare should be expensive and actually what's being paid now is artificially depressed. Just like in California, you want earthquake proof buildings, they're gonna cost a little more. You want high quality childcare, you need well compensated practitioners. And so the Build Back Better Act also has every state conduct their own contextual cost of quality study, which says to provide high quality care with well compensated practitioners, with good quality facilities, making sure the parents have good access, this is how much it costs per child and that becomes the rate that the, the parents are bringing to the centers and or to the family, to the in-home providers, to the faith-based pro programs. I did want to mention, Build Back Better Act actually strengthens faith-based faith -based child care. Faith-based child care is also struggling from, from staffing shortages. They're also closing en masse, and this will strengthen the workforce for them as well. So those are some of the specific provisions that will assist with the staffing shortages. Very well. And I, I can agree with that. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields. Ms. Ocasio-Cortez is recognized for five minutes. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Chairman, and um, thank you to all of our witnesses who are here today. Uh, you know, I, I listened to some of these arguments, and uh, it reminds me 
that we are serving in a body that is only 27% women. And sometimes we have to explain in the capital of the United States of America what life is like as a woman <laughs> in this country. And the fact that childcare is not a giveaway, it is not money that is thrown away and set on fire, but for anyone who is concerned about price increases, inflation, et cetera, it's probably important to know the role that women and childcare play in all of that. We see headlines all the time about quote unquote labor shortages, which I and I think many of us would argue are dignified wage shortages, dignified job shortages, uh, which make it impossible to work. Uh, but, you know, I, I am the daughter of a domestic worker. And I grew up um, doing my homework in strangers' houses while my mom vacuumed and cleaned and, and did what needed to be done. The United States is the only country in the OECD that does not guarantee any paid family and medical leave to its citizens. Mm -hmm. And yet we come in here every day and people act as though it's impossible. We are the only developed country that doesn't do this. Mm -hmm. We have a shortage right now, a, a, a quote unquote, what is called a labor shortage. Um, but we know that this, that this labor shortage and the shortage of workers is concentrated uh, disproportionately among women and people of color, correct, Dr. Holder? That is correct, Congresswoman. Now, uh, if I'm a mother, and let's just use New York City statistics, for example, where the median income in New York City uh, per capita is about $39,000. Median. That's not even a working class or, or low income community. That's median. The median cost of childcare is $16,000 mm -hmm. in New York City. Now, that's just childcare, $1,300 a month. Then there's transportation costs. Then there's, you know, the increased cost of food because you need to pick something up on the way home. You don't have any time. You're working a job. You need to pick up your kid. It's not even worth it to work for uh, to go to work. It's too expensive to go to work for a woman to go to work. Is and or any child giving parent isn't isn't that correct, Dr. Holder? That is correct, Congresswoman Ocasio Cortez. So. Yes. Most working and most stay-at-home parents, caregiving parents who are disproportionately w women, who are already not paid equally, who are already paid cents on the dollar, and black women and Latina women especially, paid pennies on the dollar compared to men, then have to look at this and have to look at $1,300 a month in childcare, and they're making a rational economic decision to stay home. So then we see about how prices are increasing because we don't have labor who's able to take care of our supply chain issues, stock stores, keep stores open, et cetera. So childcare can actually address a bottleneck to reduce prices in the United States. Would you say that that's a, that that's a fair point worth investigating, Dr. Holder? Yes, Congresswoman, I would say that, indeed. And secondarily, um, to Ms. Aijin Pu, I want to talk about immigrant women in childcare and domestic labor in this country. Not only are the provisions investing in universal childcare, I think, critical for all women and all uh, caregiving parents of all genders to be able to re-enter the workforce, but what do, does the prospect and the potential, if the Senate is able to override the parliamentarian and provide a path to citizenship, what could that also do in terms of the implications for our labor force and our supply of dignified work and childcare and domestic work in this country? It would help make care jobs good jobs because we would be able to transform, we would be able to establish and enforce a floor of good jobs in the care sector 
right now, uh, immigrant women are disproportionately concentrated in childcare jobs, in elder care jobs. A third of the home care workforce is foreign born. There's actually no way that we can take care of American families in this country without immigrant women and without immigrant women having secure jobs. And those secure jobs will enable us to secure all care jobs, which will enable us to secure the entire workforce. Thank you, and with that, I hope the committee perhaps has a sliver of a better understanding of what it's like to be a woman in the United States of America. So thank you very much, and I yield. The gentlelady's time has expired. Ms. Jacobs is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I associate myself with the comments of my colleagues uh, right before me. I wanna thank you all for the work that you're doing to help make the case for the Build Back Better Act and, and the care economy that we know is so important. I'm gonna magically fast forward us to post Build Back Better Act world. We passed it, it's great, it's amazing. And now we're looking ahead at the future. Um, and I know, um, uh, Ms. Poo, you said uh, that these care jobs can't be outsourced or automated. We know actually that home health aides are projected to have more job openings than any other job by 2030, that 40% of the fastest growing jobs are in care fields. Um, we've also heard a lot today about the need for more care workers um, and how, uh, you know, for, for us in San Diego, even before the pandemic, we had about 190,000 children who didn't have access to the care they needed because of some of those shortages. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit um, and elaborate more on your thoughts on how the care economy intersects with the future of work and what trends in automation and globalization you see impacting care jobs and why. Thank you, Congresswoman, for the question. There's been a lot of talk about how automation is gonna displace jobs. Um, and that the future of work is really uncertain because robots are coming. And the truth is there is a lot of uncertainty about the future of work and technology is changing everything. But one thing we know for sure is that we need care jobs. And these are jobs that by definition can't be outsourced, right? <laughs> and until we develop an algorithm for empathy, we are going to need human beings doing this work. And so it is a responsibility, I think, that we have to make these jobs living wage, secure jobs with benefits, and that is solving for the future of work. Some economists are predicting that 30% of the, that actually by the year 2030, care jobs will be the largest occupation in the entire economy if you take child care and elder care jobs combined. So this is about securing the future of work. Thank you, um, I appreciate that uh, and uh, very much ag agree with your analysis. We've heard a lot about how the Build Back Better Act is going to be spending all this money that we already have a high deficit. Um, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the fiscal responsibility of some of these investments actually. So um, Dr. Holder, in your testimony, you discussed investments in care supporting the economy and the next generation. Can you talk about some of the economic returns of public investments in care? And would it be fair to say that these investments pay for themselves over time? And, and would you consider these investments fiscally responsible? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman, for that question. Um, uh, public investments in high quality early care programs are some of the most cost effective investments around. We at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth recently published a cost benefit analysis of the pre-K program included in President Biden's American Families Plan, which is similar to what was included in the House passed Build Back Better Act. The analysis conducted by economics professor Robert Lynch found that the annual benefits are expected to exceed government costs within the first 10 years of the program. The benefits take the form of higher wages and earnings, government budget benefits, and reduced cost individuals. So in the short term, we expect the fiscal benefits to exceed costs relatively quickly. In the long term, however, is where we see the economic benefits begin to really stack up. By year 35, when the first cohort of children in pre-K are now parents, workers, and breadwinners in their own right, the benefits of this pre-K spending are expected to exceed cost 10 to one, boosting GDP by uh, half a percentage point and generating as many as 787,000 new jobs. So we do believe that these, this program is, is fiscally responsible. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Haspel, in your written testimony, you cited research from the Minneapolis Federal Reserve that found that the return on a focused high quality early childhood development program could be as high as 16%. Um, based on your understanding of, of the research, would you consider investments in early child care and education to be fiscally responsible and why? Uh, 
is Congresswoman, I would consider not only be fiscally responsible, but actually fiscally smart. So what we know is that it, it puts an incredible amount of money into the economy because you do have more women entering the labor force at higher levels. Also, we talk about the business perspective. Businesses struggle because of retention, um, productivity from absences due to childcare breakdowns, and then the childcare workforce itself, as noted, over two million people in this country are childcare practitioners, many of which are making poverty wages. If you raise them into the middle class, that's a huge benefit as well in terms of tax rolls. And so, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce came out with a report recently showing that in states like Arizona, uh, $1.77 billion are getting lost every year, and Texas is nearly $10 billion. So again, red states, blue states, rural, urban, every state is actually losing huge amounts of economic productivity and also the opportunity cost of the gains of economic productivity from having a functional child care system. So I actually think that the country is actually in a worse fiscal shape for not investing in the care economy than it would be for making these investments. Thank you. I yield back. Gentlemen, time is expired. Um, I'd like to thank our witnesses for their testimony in a very good conversation today. We very much appreciate your presence and the information you brought uh, to us today. Uh, without objection, all members will have 10 legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. And without objection, all members will have 10 legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. I also ask unanimous consent to place into the record a, uh, an article by Mr. David Kirp entitled, A Way to Break the Cycle of Poverty. So ordered. I remind members that written questions and materials for the record should be submitted to the email address provided to your offices. Again, thank you to all of our witnesses, and this hearing is adjourned. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I got a lunch, but I'm going to try right. to make it back yeah, to yeah. some questions. Yeah. <clears throat>